good afternoon to everyone um, out there in the video land, because it's pretty lonely in here. Um, like to welcome you to the Precision Medicine uh, monthly uh, meeting. Uh, today's speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Yusin uh, Su, who uh, is fortunately for us in our department, OBGYN. She's the uh, Charles and Marie Robertson professor. She's in, actually in our department where she's director of reproductive aging, but she's also got an appointment in the Department of Genetics and Development. Um, Yusin's uh, CV is extensive. Uh, she has done an incredible amount of work, most of it um, funded. One of the things that I, I hope Yusin mentions, but she may not, uh, she came here from Einstein and at Einstein, she had a cohort uh, that she followed and the members of the cohort all had to be a hundred years of age or older to be part of the cohort. So I'm trying to get in that sooner or later. Um, and needless to say, Yusin studies um, uh, basically the basic metabolism and genetics and epigenetics associated with aging. And you might say, what is she doing in an OBGYN department? But she actually, um, we convinced her and that looking at reproductive aging was an important issue on, on many levels. And she certainly will talk about that. So today's talk is her work that she's been doing on ovarian aging. And Yusin, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, thank you so much, Ron, for this very kind introduction. So uh, as Ron said, you know, I have been um, using the human genetics and functional genetics of the world to understand the fundamental mechanisms of aging. And as I have, oh, hi, so thank you for coming in for sharing. So, uh, you know, shown here are the pictures of centenarians that Ron mentioned that we've been studying um, to find the longevity factors you know, to make us living healthier and longer. But today I'm not going to talk about centenarians. Instead, I'm going to talk about the mechanism of ovarian aging, as Ron mentioned. Um, this is very new area of research for me. Uh, and hopefully at the end of the talk, I will have uh, convinced you that ovarian aging can be a target to um, what we call gerb protection, meaning that targeting the basic biology region, thereby um, making women living longer and healthier. So before I go into the science, I really like to thank Mary, um, the department chair of OBGYN. And as Ron mentioned, um, this is totally new area of my research, but I really appreciate Mary's vision of recognizing the importance of female reproductive aging, which has been heavily understudied and mostly ignored and convinced me to come to Colombia to establish this very exciting and important new program on reproductive aging. And I also like to thank Ron, Seb, and Raja and others to guide me through to this new area of research. So thank you so much. So as Ron mentioned, we moved uh, from Einstein end of uh, 2019, uh, right before the moment. Um, but through and through, this is where we are now. So, aim at that. And so clearly we have grown in size by like almost twofold. So not only from science point of view, but the whole, everything was good. I think this was very good move for me. So thank you so much. So going back to the mechanism of ovarian age. Um, so why do we care of ovarian age? So first of all, uh, women live longer than men in any of the countries. So shown here is life, life expectancy between men in um, x-axis, oh, sorry, it's men in x-axis and women in y-axis. And the, the data points uh, indicate the above in the you know, middle of them is uh, equality, meaning that in every country, women live longer than men, right? Regardless of their 
life expectancy, right? So, you know, the, on the left hand, um, those are countries like Nigeria, you know, they're, they have very short life expectancy, or like over there with Japan, it has much uh, longer life expectancy that regardless, women outlive men in, in all of these countries. Interestingly though, women are less healthy than men. Right? So this is um, the effect of being woman on um, physical disabilities. So if it's equal, it's going to be one, but you can see that in all the countries, it's between 1.5 to 2.5, indicating that women are likely to suffer from uh, physical functioning disabilities. But the most striking is uh, women have much shorter reproductive lifespan. So in fact, the female reproductive system is the first, the very first to age in the body, which begins when women are in their mid thirties with a rather dramatic decline in function culminating in menopause around age of 50. So you can see that the oldest woman who gave birth naturally is 59, whereas men, you know, produce opposite naturally is 92. So you can see this striking difference. So in the over the last 150 years or so, the human uh, lifespan has increased almost twofold. So now the rate is like six hours per day. So we are living longer and longer and longer, but despite this enormous increase in human life expectancy, the age of menopause may stays the same as this, meaning that women, uh, more and more women, live an ever ever larger proportion of their lives in a postmenopausal stage. Is it really bad? We think it is bad because. Menopause coincides with a cascade of deleterious health outcomes in cognitive, behavior, and cardiovascular disease, among others. In fact, menopause actually accelerates biological aging as measured by epigenetics. This work done by Levine and Gordon has shown that. Um, there is actually genetic component of this menopause induced accelerated age. So consistent with this genetic thing, women live who undergo menopause at later age live longer than women who undergo menopause in earlier age. And also brothers of women with later menopause have longevity benefits than rather women are their men. So, so in other words, what we are trying to understand is not going to benefit only women, but in general, men. So I'm going to uh, come back to that point. So it looks like ovary does um, just more than reproduction and has um, influence, impact on over health in women, right? So what happens if you remove so ovariectomy or oporectomy increases risk for um, not only the single age-related diseases such as dementia, cardiovascular disease, or but also it increases risk for multiple morbidity as well as all cause mortality. So surgically induced menopause is associated with decreased health and decreased lifespan. So like in humans, oh, so, so consistently, if you conserve over at the time of hysterectomy, then those women live longer than women with a uh, completely ovarian. Okay, so again, ovary seems to do much more than just reproduction and influence overall health. And like in humans, uh, Overreaction in the eyes actually shortens lifespan. 
But what's interesting is that if you transplant young ovary into old ovary mice, mice, then it that young ovary, the transplant young ovary, helps to extend lifespan, as well as helps them in part by um, improving you know, insulin sensitivity and um, decreasing um, inflammation. But what's interesting, although I didn't show the data in the back, is that if you uh, remove the um, hormone, sex hormone producing cells from ovary, like you can chemically remove through the use removal chemical, I mean, the sex hormone producing cells, and then transplant um, young, I'm sorry, that you know, young the sex hormone producing cells removed ovary to old mice, it still confers productivity, suggesting that some somatic cells may influence also the productivity. So it's quite surprising that this um, young ovary is capable of um, influencing this overall health. So now, uh, in the field of aging, we know that aging is by single large risk factor for all kinds of diseases. For example, Alzheimer's disease. So simply getting old from age 50 to 75, increased risk of Alzheimer's disease by 100 points. Okay, which really toward the tenfold of the increase of risk by all combined risk factor of the um, Alzheimer's disease, such as a boy genotype, being a woman, hypertension, smoking, physical inactivity, and diabetes. Okay. And same is true for almost all chronic diseases, cardiovascular disease, different types of cancer, and um, type two diabetes, immune decline, and so on. So in the field of aging biology, we hypothesize that since aging is the risk factor for all chronic diseases, the targeting of the basic biology of aging will help target all chronic diseases at once. So this is called geroscience hypothesis and has been, um, you cannot hear. Thank you. So, so, um, so the geroscience has been the major uh, research framework in the field of aging biology. So now this geroscience hypothesis has been formulated based on many decades of very elegant research done in modern organisms from yeast to worms to flies and mice. And we now have good understanding of what's happening during aging processes. It's caused hallmarks of aging, right? Increase in genome instability, telomere attrition, epigenetic alterations, uh, loss of homeostasis, protein homeostasis, and so on. So under this uh, geroscience framework, um, you know, I have shown you the data from uh, human and mouse study that ovary does more than reproduction and influence over health. So the biology of ovarian aging can be targeted for gerald protection in, in, in women, right? So what's basic biology of ovarian aging? Um, unfortunately, we know very little about basic biology of aging. So my, if you look at um, ovary, it's a very complex organ with many different cell types that support ovarian function. So there are eight um, major somatic cell types in the ovary. So, so it, including uh, thicker cells and granulosa cells that sort of surround, immediately surround um, um, that making the follicles, right? And um, so we have decided to use more on a bias approach, um, comprehensive and systematic, uh, by using multi-omic um, methods. So, of course, that in my lab, Chen Jin, um, he decided to take um, 
ovaries from you know, reproductively young uh, women um, in age 20s and reproductively old in women in age late 40s and early 50s. Okay. And perform um, single cell multiomic analysis for you know, aging transcriptome by um, single nuclear RNA as well as um, aging related regulatory changes by single cell ATC signals. And then we were able to identify all eight major ovarian cell types in this analysis. And I would like to highlight some of the major discoveries that we have made thus far from this analysis. So first of all, aging um, remodels the cellular architecture of human ovary. So you can see that um, cell types like um, endothelial cells, granulosa cells, and um, uh, the thicker cells, um, the proportion of those cells decline with age. Whereas uh, epithelial cells, the proportion increase with age as compared to young ovary. Right? And when you look at this so-called um, aging genes, and we found some, some 3,000 genes that the expression of which go up and down with age, right? And each row indicate uh, different cell types of um, the ovary. So you can see uh, stromal cells, um, uh, endothelial cells, granulosa cells, muscle cells, immune cells, and epithelial cells, and thicker cells. And when you look at this um, aging genes, differentially expressed aging genes, Surprisingly, they are enriched for the hallmark of um, aging. But what's important in here is that if you look at the direction of change, then they, they go to the same direction, namely genes that are upregulated with age in one cell type and to be up in other cell types, right? So you see all this blue, and then which is downregulated, and then red, which are uh, upregulated with age. And then you see that they are enriched for so called hallmark of aging, as if the ovary transcriptome show this um, coordinated changes in expression. So when you look at those um, enriched pathways in these aging cells, then um, you can see this, um, you know, some of the downregulated um, Oh yes, um, pathways such as uh, protein homeostasis, um, DNA repair, oxidative phosphorylation, whereas you see upregulation of nutrient sensing signaling, such as mTOR or um, insulin um, signaling pathway. What's interesting here is that uh, mTOR is a central regulator of aging, and its inhibitor, rapamycin is known to um, extend lifespan and health span in almost all modern organisms that we have tested thus far, including some of the uh, wild animals. So rapamycin has been used as a um, gold standard of general protector, again, the drug that targets the fundamental biology of aging, thereby uh, promote lifespan and health span. Okay. So I will talk to you a little bit more about rapamycin. So in mice, rapamycin that, uh, that fed late in life is enough to extend lifespan in, um, in mice. Okay, this is very robust study done by um, NI, National Institute on Aging's uh, intervention testing program done in four different locations. Very robust study, right? So, after this study was shown that rapamycin is really slows aging in different organs and tissues, including brain, heart, immune, muscle, and more recently, uh, over. So here I show some of the uh, papers that reporting the treatment of rapamycin rodents, mice and uh, rats, uh, increase ovarian lifespan and fertility in mice. 
what's interesting is that if you do um, transient treat treatment rapamycin, so 12 weeks at um, 12 months of age, which is equivalent, human equivalent of 60 year old, then uh, it's enough to extend lifespan much longer than the treatment dates, right? So 90 days treatment, lifespan extension effect is 140. So this is equivalent to 20 years for 50 year old by substitution. So transgenic uh, treatment rapamycin is enough to promote healthy aging and longevity in mice. So then why don't we take rapamycin? So as you know, it's a um, immunosuppressant. So it has bad reputation, but this is drug that's been treated for sick people who need uh, organ transplantation and, and very high dose, okay? And it has side effects, many side effects. But it turned out that low dose rapamycin healthy people is very safe. So there's increasing data. So low dose means between five to six to seven, eight um, milligram per week, okay, for three to uh, four months actually has positive input in human health, okay, including the immune, enhances immune function, okay. So our study showed that um, in, in the ovary during uh, aging processes, you see this upregulation at mTOR signaling, suggesting that maybe uh, rapamycin can be a geoprotector in the uh, ovarian age, right? So based on this um, results, now we have um, established this clinical trial to um, evaluate the ability of rapamycin to extend a female reproductive lifespan in humans. We were very lucky to get this uh, clinical trial funded by Impact Strength round one, and we just got our uh, IRB approved. So we are very excited to uh, initiate this trial. But now that we have this wonderful um, clinical trial cohort, we are going to use the same cohort to identify uh, human biomarkers and to gain some mechanistic insight from this um, rapamycin effect, right? So again, we were very lucky to get um, this the biomarker discovery work funded by uh, Impact and Screen Round. So another um, hallmark of aging is um, increasing cellular senescence. Cellular senescence is a uh, stress response of cells. And as you may know, that this is strong tumor suppressor mechanism. And in response to oncogenic stimuli, um, cells stop growing that undergo cellular state called senescence, okay. Uh, but what's interesting is that um, the senescent cells are um, known to contribute to age. It has been demonstrated in mouse models. So if you, uh, if you selectively remove senescent cells using drug called senolytics or senomorphics, then uh, you increase lifespan in mice. Okay. But what's bad about this is senescent cells, it, 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 it secretes a um, suite of pro-inflammatory cytokines and other um, extracellular matrix remodeling molecules. Uh, it's collectively called CES, cellular senescence associated uh, secretory phenotype. Okay. So those CES, is pro-inflammatory is going to um, influence neighboring cells in a negative way. So we ask questions, if the senescent cell um, increase during aging in the ovary. And um, the problem with the senescent cells is there's no canonical molecular markers. I mean, people use just P16 or P21 as a potential markers of senescence, but it, it's really not clear because the phenotype, molecular and cellular phenotypes are quite um, heterogeneous. So in our case, P16 expression is exceedingly low. We couldn't really detect it much, it's less than 0.5%. But 
but P21 expression was quite substantial, so about nine to ten percent. And then we found that the proportion of P21 um, expressing curative senescent cells increase in proportion with age in, in the ovary, right? So you can see that stroma cells, uh, endothelial cells, and granulosa cells, smooth muscle cell, and thicker cells. And we also um, validate this um, inside to using RNA scope that you see not only the proportion of P21 expressing cells, but the intensity of P21 expression increase with age in the ovary. And when you look at um, the transcriptome of these P21 expressing cells, then you can see the, the canonical cess um, signature okay, in, across all different cell types. And when you look at this transcriptome of P21 expressing senescent cells, I showed this just stromal cells as an example, you see um, the the signature of um, the hypoxic signal, the HIP-1 signaling path, suggesting that maybe this hypoxic signal um, conditions with age contribute to a senescence in, um, in senescence in the ovary. Okay, so what we are doing right now is to uh, use this um, spatial transcriptomic uh, analysis in collaboration with uh, Imani Patanani at the neurology department um, to map carefully uh, and, and also to identify biomarkers of senescent cells in the ovary. So this is ongoing. Hopefully I'll be able to talk about it uh, in uh, six months, one year. But, but what we think that uh, the values of the pop, the value of our data to us is really to help understand or interpret um, human genetics. So you know that there are increasing um, genome-wide association studies in, in any human trait, including age and natural menopause. So this is most recent uh, GWAS data uh, associated with um, menopause, natural menopause and identifying over um, almost 300 variants that are associated with different timing of menopause. This is quite robust data set from uh, more than 200,000 women. And then when you look at those variants, far majority of these variants occur in the non-coding regions of the genome, which is the same as or maybe all other genome-wide association studies, suggesting that regulatory changes, if any, contribute to this inter-individual variability in uh, timing of benefits, right? But the problem is, since there are known coding, right, it, it's, there are many challenges to interpret these results and to identify um, you know, genetic risk factors, number one, because um, this extensive linguist disequilibrium in the human genome, they are all correlated. So to identify true causal variants, functional variants that may alter gene regulation is challenging, number one. Number two, oftentimes this regulatory element, they work in, uh, from great distance, like enhanced Right? Sometimes they are skipping many genes in between to identify those targets. So to identify causal genes that are influenced by this regulatory variant is challenging. I mean, right now, most GWAS pick just ne nearest gene as a target, which can not always true. Actually, in our analysis, uh, less than half of them are nearest gene. And also the regulatory elements such as enhancers, it has a cell type specific and signal dependent activity, right? So to identify causal cell types that are under influence this, of this regulatory variant is challenging, let alone the mechanisms you know, for the transcription factors that are dysregulated by regulatory variants. 
So to address this, what we did was look at um, menopausal suicide variants and see where do they occur in um, the putative cis regulatory elements detected by ATC, right? So consistent with our uh, RNA seq data, which shows this you know, coordinated changes across the cell type, you see um, those variants occur in the um, cis regulatory element in many different cell types at the same time. See that? I mean, of course, you see this cell type specific element um, harboring this variant, like you know, at the end of the right panel, this is stroma cells. But huge amount of um, menopausal associated variants actually occur in regulatory elements across different cell types of the ovary. Right? So meaning that they have this global impact throughout the uh, ovarian cell types. The other thing that you can do is to do what others do, namely, you take the nearest gene as your potential target and then see which cell type you are enriched, okay, for um, menopause associated variants. And then we found that they are enriched for in um, all, almost all different cell types, somatic cell types in the ovary, except for, except for epithelial cells. Remember, I showed that you know, a lot of uh, cell types, they decline with age in proportion, but epithelial cells is the only one that increases with age. So in comparison, we also look at um, GWAS that are associated with uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, which is um, hormonal disorder that occurs among reproductive aged women, okay? And then you see and that, that those variants are enriched for in um, granulosa cells, which produce uh, hormone. Okay. And this is ovarian epithelial cancer, okay? The variants that are associated with this epithelial cancer, and then those genes are enriched in epithelial cells. So this is really striking results to us that menopause associated variants, you know, they may dysregulate genes in across all somatic cell types in the ovary. Again, have more global impact rather than cell type specific impact uh, on uh, gene expression changes. So now we can begin to uh, identify causal variants, causal genes, and the mechanism and also cell types, right? So I'm gonna give you a um, couple of examples. So for example, Vaptor is a uh, major component of mTOR signal. And interestingly, expression of Vaptor increased with age in um, ovarian cells and, like granulosa cells and thick cells, okay? And then when you look at um, purity, causal variant, that occur in regulatory elements that are supposed to be active in different cell types. I just believe in you what I'm saying. This is very difficult to see, but then you see that um, this um, the potentially causal regulatory variants, RS1326329, you know, it overlaps with um, 236329 the regulatory elements in across different cell types, right? Stroma cells. Uh, endothelial cells, thicca cells, granulosa cells, smooth muscle cell, and immune cells. And then when you look at those uh, sequence then, um, and look at the transcription factor binding of activity disease uh, in silico analysis, then this variant is um, you know, predicted to bind um, transcription factors, so enhanced binding to transcription factors. By the way, this variant is associated with early menopause. Okay, so the variants that show um, may be involved in this regulation of adapter is um, associated with early menopause. On the other hand, uh, HELB is a DNA repair gene. And um, it's associated with um, variants in this loci, locus. It's associated with uh, age at later 
age and nature models. And then we also identified potentially regulatory functional variants on top that's RS374105. And again, you see that they occur in curative regulatory element in across multiple cell types, right? Trauma cells, cilial cells, thicker cells, and green lust cells. Okay. What's interesting is that when you do when you look at the GTEx, okay, this variant is associated with increased expression in uh, in ovary. Okay, so this is called um, expression TTL, right? So but not only the ovary, what's in, interesting is that this variant is correlated with, the, with increased expression of healthy in all the tissues that have been interrogated in GTEx. So this is where I uh, mentioned the brothers of women who undergo um, menopause later may have blooms of itself. So they may contribute to um, healthy aging in men as well. This is important enzyme. And, and also uh, they are predicted to increase uh, binding to transcription factors of course it's in silicon. Okay. So we were quite um, struck by this dichotomy, right? On the one hand, uh, the pro-aging pathway genes such as Daptor, you found the variants um, that are associated with increased expression, which then associate with earlier age of um, natural menopause. On the other hand, pro-longevity pathways such as DNA repair like LB, the functional variance in that locus is correlated with increased expression, which in turn correlate with um, later age and natural menopause. So this is at most, you know, it's exciting, but it's at most correlation and prediction. Okay, is it really true? So the way we approach this is to use human uh, pluripotent stem cells, such as embryonic stem cell or induced pluripotent stem cell. And then we engineer those with CRISPR so that it carries that particular coding, I mean, regulatory causal variant. And then we differentiate them into multiple cell types of the over. Closer cells, epithelial cells, muscular cells, doesn't come stem cells. Okay. And then we can study the regulatory output as we predicted from in silico analysis, right? So that in, is it really causal that dysregulate the causal genes that we identified? And this is very important. What is the directional impact it's when you have this variant? Is it make gene, your target gene expression more? or less, right? And then, you know, what are the cell types that are targeted by these variants? And obviously the underlying mechanisms, including responsible transcription factors. Okay. So I'm going to show you um, preliminary results that um, in, in healthy um, variants. So, so this variant, you know, RS374105 is a causal, curative regulatory variants that we discovered, okay, which is correlated with the later menopause. So this is um, heterozygote cells that carries both um, the reference allele and the later menopause associated allele. Interestingly, this um, regulatory variant is in uh, linkage equilibrium with this coding variant in you know this in this uh, exon, right? So RS4430553. Okay. So we can use the variant in the in the RNA as a, a proxy of the activity of your regulatory variant. Okay. So since it, this is a heterozygote, it, this is perfect because everything else is the same except for that particular variant. Okay, and then you can design a little specific um, digital PCR for that um, sequence in the uh, RNA. So you can do qPCR analysis. Okay, so control experiment. 
when you take genomic DNA, of course, this is one copy versus one copy, you see um, half and half, okay? But when you differentiate this uh, stem cell into different cell types of ovary, like endothelial cells, smooth muscle cell, as a kind of stem cell, and granulosa cell, as predicted by our interiorative analysis, the allele, C allele, that are correlated with the later menopause in healthy contribute more to the expression of healthy gene. Namely that it now, not correlation, but cause increased expression of healthy. So this is um, where we are. And uh, we are now uh, using this approach to um, test our top candidates, top causal candidates and um, causal genes for um, the impact of the regulatory variants that we detect. Okay. So to summarize, uh, ovary represent the model of accelerated aging and ovary influence health span and lifespan as well as reproductive health in women as well as mice. Um, and our single cell multiomic analysis show that uh, ovary age through the conserved mechanism of aging across all cell types. And uh, by integrating human genetics data, we could identify um, causal regulatory variants that are involved in modulation of timing of ovarian aging through modulation of gene expression. So taken together, our data suggests that maybe ovary can be a um, target for germ protection in women, such as mycin or um, Synonetics, which targets specifically for uh, senescent cells. Okay. So with that, I'd like to thank members of the lab. Uh, again, this uh, project is spearheaded by Chen with the help from other people, including Sung Su, Adam, CJ, Ji Ping, and Ming Zhou. And also wonderful collaborators, um, Jeff Rosenfeld, uh, Seth um, and Roger, uh, Matt Cavallon in Washington, Jude Campisi and Yang Roberts. And I'd also like to thank the funding agencies, NIA and um, Global Consortium for Reproductive uh, Longevity and Equality. With that, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, we can take questions either orally, if one wants to just ask over the Zoom, or if somebody wants to put a note, we'll start with the people in the room. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Sure. All right. I've had a lot of questions we can talk later, uh, but is there anything in your single cell analysis that says that ovarian aging is different than other organs? Do you see what I'm getting at? Like yeah. a lot of these hallmarks of aging are gonna yeah. be evident in any age tissue type. Is there something that jumps out and over oh, yeah, yeah. that's not? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like, like a hormone, sex hormone producing pathways. Yeah, and... but not something, yeah. I guess something that isn't part of ovarian biology. So yeah. it's not specific to ovarian biology. Yeah, actually we, we really didn't see much. So it was just a screaming hallmarks of aging, yeah. right? So, um, what I didn't show here is that um, the interaction between uh, soma and the germ cells. I mean, this is again in silico. Yeah. You can look at the, based on the RNA seq data, you can look at the, their interactions, right? Because there's a light and you know, receptors and how they are expressed, portion. They, they change dramatically. So we think this is germ cells germ to soma interaction is very critical for uh, ovarian aging. Yeah. Other questions anywhere? Oh, just, yes, not a question, but just some daydreaming idea. Like I saw you were comparing the two different uh, net ex expression in the uh, different cell types mm -hmm. based on the job, uh, digital PCR. Yeah. But it would also be really cool if you can do an actual localization of the um, different um, 
yeah. and Leo. Yeah. And then I just written to Lisa A and self image, and then they were able to throw uh, two um, different uh, X, uh, X chromosome mosaic expression mm -hmm. in uh, different tissue type, which could be uh, ideally could be used in, in your study to localize the expression of two different allele in a different cell type if you still have the tissue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean at the RNA level? Oh, yeah. RNA or yeah, at the expression level. Expression level, yeah. So we, right now we are using uh, RNA scope for um, validation studies, but maybe we need more fancy imaging. No, no, now it's really, really fancy already. But I would say if you were interested in the actual localization mm -hmm. instead of the uh, the ratio as we did by digital piece, uh, uh, right. then you might want to add another pretty, pretty yeah. picture on it. Yeah, yeah. we should talk about it. There is a question in, in the chat, two questions. One I know somebody would ask, um, are there any rapamycin ongoing trials and <laughs> people that are using rapamycin off? Uh, yeah, this actually big? off label, people are using um, rapamycin as a, I mean, they don't call it gel protective, they call it anti-aging. So there are actually many people within the field who's been taking rapamycin. I mean, it's really not that, it's a low dose once a week, five milligram per week for a couple of months, right? So a lot of people are doing an off label, okay? But there are two, to my knowledge, a clinical trial against arsenicides because the effect of rapamycin against arsenicides mouse model that has been quite, Impressive. So that's trials are ongoing. Yeah. And then um, the other question is: Is there a difference between testicular and ovarian aging, and mm -hmm. why do testicles take a lot longer to age than ovaries? That's a good point. We don't know actually. Yeah, we, we don't know. We didn't do a side by side comparison. And um, any. Uh, information about rapamycin and ovarian cancer or any kinds of cancer? So, or actually ovarian aging. Is there any correlation between ovarian aging and cancer? In cancer, ovarian aging and cancer. So, um, you know, it, it, it's, so it's a little bit complex, right? So, for example, uh, senescence is double edged sword. So, on the one hand, it's a it's good for you because it's a strong tumor suppressor, okay. But it's bad for you when you're old because it does all those negative things through the secretion. So menopause, ovarian aging is also the same. So it's correlated with uh, increased risk for um, so early menopause is increased risk for many chronic diseases. But on the other hand, if you have a later menopause and you have a higher risk for ovarian cancer, it's, it's epidemiologists, right? So, so we showed the data that epithelial cell, the proportion increase with age in the ovary, which may contribute to epithelial ovarian aging, we don't know, cancer, sorry, cancer. Okay. And the rapamycin, actually rapamycin has been used as a cancer drug, right? in many different trials. And um, um, in mice, actually, when uh, rapamycin treated mice and live longer, there's no differences in cancer um, mm. incidence of prevalence. So we do know that at least it does not increase cancer, at least in mice, but humans, I don't know. And how long till you think you will have a human trial up and running? Oh, so our study design is uh, three months um, treatment um, every week, and then we'll do a nine-month follow-up. And the follow-up is going to involve what? You're going to biopsy the ovary? No, it's all blood. The blood. blood. Yeah, the ovarian reserve and the use hormone. Hormone. Yeah. And inflammation. What do you know about people that have? premature ovarian failure, yeah. like fragile X or yeah. people like that? Yeah, actually Zev has shown that um, 
the fraser X mice, FMR mice, with arapamycin, it, it expands reproductive life cycle, increased fertility. Mm. So maybe uh, you know, useful um, or good starting point to the trial for good rapamycin. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? We have about two minutes. Sure. Yes, please. Um, so, so in the help B gene, you have the causal, but you have the non-coding and the coding mutation. I, I guess I didn't understand how you decided that it was the regulatory mutation that's causal rather than the one in You are so smart, Luke. That's 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 things that we are doing now because those uh, regu uh, coding variants are not. It's missense. I was going to ask that. Yeah, it's a missense. So if it's right? silent, then of course, then that yeah. answers that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are doing it now. So it's, are there but, any but at least, that but, have a breakpoint between those two sites? Yeah. Where the you break the linkage just equilibrium? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I know. It'd be yeah. Great. Maybe maybe we can do uh, with uh, CRISPR. Yeah, you should NPR. definitely capture yeah, sure. But those we are doing because, you know, because of this LD. You yeah. don't know which yeah. one is right, but at least what we do know is that that regulatory variant is correlated with the increased expression of health. But right? the coding variant could also change the expression by changing the steady state level. Yeah, of we cannot rule that out. Absolutely. So we are doing that now. We are doing uh, yeah. engineering. Yeah. yeah. Very good point. And then we also want to measure in TV inventory. Yeah, of course. The, the, the real yeah. the town streets. Yeah. So, HELB is very interesting gene yeah. because there's a mutation in HELB, I'm talking about missense mutation, that destroy HELB function that's correlated with actually cause early menopause. Oh, wow. That's exciting. Yeah. So, it's a two side, right? Yeah, HELB yeah. is an interesting. Program. Rare variant, oh, rare okay. variant, rare variant, uh, coding variant. Okay. Then you undergo menopause way out. That's interesting. And then there are those hyper resecting. Do those... No one has ever tested anything. Okay. That's why we are interested in doing it. Right. Okay. That's why it's so hard to get into your 100 year old uh, centenary club. That's a rare. Yeah, I mean, it's, so centenary is also a little bit you know, different because they, it's an anecdote, but they tend to have um, small number of offspring, we don't know. So, yeah. Yeah, having it's kids can really wear you out. <laughs> but <laughs> it's not gonna affect all models. Do you know the age of uh, menopause in your centenarian population, the women? <sighs> you know, I tried to figure it out, but it was very difficult to um, follow. Mm. Mm. And, Finally, first of all, thank you very, very much for your wonderful talk. Thank you. And second of all, as far as a commercial, uh, Yusin is looking for really smart, bright postdocs. There's great opportunity, particularly those interested in women's health care and, and women's aging, um, or junior faculty also. So if you're interested, yeah. just get in touch with Yeah, you. I'd love to set up collaborations too. Yeah, very good. Well, thank you. Thank much you so much. It. Thank you.